and the infancy gospel of James, it like challenges all all scientific logic that we know, and yet people have a lot of faith in this particular document. So I think that's the document that really created this deity. And so it's not an accident that the Black Madonnas are found throughout the world. They their trinity consisted of Mary, Father, and Jesus. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, I'm with Dr. Carla Ionescu, has the channel with the link in the description, is one of my, the Goddess Project. I love this channel a lot. If anyone is new, hasn't seen our last live we did, definitely go and check out that channel. Link's in the description. Today, we're talking about the, com the comparison between Mother of Mary or even maybe Mary Magdalene, maybe both. I'm not sure where, where, where you're at with that, but uh, definitely Mother Mary and Artemis. And well, the reason why I presented maybe Mary too, Matt Magdalene too, because I, I talked to another uh, Egyptologist about the same question with Isis and Egypt. And there was, some, there was some overlap there. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is happening with some, another goddess somewhere else as well. Because I think Christianity sort of takes on this role of syncretism where it, kind of i don't mean this in like a they're stealing way i mean this in like a, in a normal way like why wouldn't you want to adapt the cultures around you and you know respond to the, all the other cultures around you so uh, with mary and artemis let's what's the comparison that we would start off with when we're looking at these two characters in history and, and mythology <sighs> Okay, so hi Neil. It's How you doing? <laughs> it's good to be back. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at Artemis of Ephesus and the Virgin Mary. Mary Magdalene is a little more different because I think that she is more, I don't know if that's the right word, but more human, uh, more like wife material. Yeah. And sort of like the, the what happens after, like the line that happens after Jesus passes away, if, if such a line exists, which I think it does, but you know, obviously there's other people with their opinions, but the Virgin Mary, because she becomes Theotokos, she becomes the mother of God, she becomes deified, really fits more with the ancient goddesses. So many scholars call the Virgin Mary's birth the last virgin birth, because there had been many virgin births, right? Like there's many in all over, in the, right? The ancient world. But I think the Christians believe or believed or worked out worked at it to create this last virgin birth. So there's no one to have a virgin birth after Mary. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reason why I picked uh, Ephesus, and I think a lot of people look at Ephesus, well, there's a couple of reasons. Let's start with the physical ones. The, the fact that Mary, the mother of Jesus, probably died in Ephesus. There are two locations where Mary, the mother of Jesus, may have died, the Virgin Mary. She either died in Jerusalem after her son was killed or later on, or she went with John to Ephesus. Now, there's a ton of evidence that John went to Ephesus and settled in Ephesus. Um, and John, the brother of Jesus, some Christians think he's just the apostle of Jesus, but whatever, either way, brother, biological brother or brother by apostle, same thing. He is the one when Jesus is on the cross and says, uh, take care of uh, your mother, right? Um, and so he is said then to, he is believed to take the Virgin Mary and take her to Ephesus. And there's a house, remember, there's a house to the Virgin Mary near the uh, Artemis John, which is the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. And this is a house where Mary is said to have lived and died. It's a house where miracles are said to have happened. Um, young children have had visions of Mary talking to them. It took a couple hundred years for the church to accept that this is the house of Mary. Now, of course, they accept that. And so this is a house of prayer and it's a sacred site. Blah, blah. So that's, mm. that's, that's a physical example. Yeah. Right. Can I ask you before yeah. you just real quick, where does that legend start? Is it early on with that, with that place? The house of Mary. Yeah. Um, 
I would, okay, so I would say that the very first, I'm going to find my notes here. Sure. I would say that the very first instance that people refer to is the fact that Jesus looks at John and says, take your mother away or keep your mother safe or keep our mother safe or something like that. So I would say that people begin to follow John. So wherever John ends up. Okay. So gotcha. that that would technically be almost right away after the death of Jesus, because John so this is this location is where John is staying. Is that is that what? That's right. That's oh, right. Oh, okay. That's All right, right, that makes sense. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, that's fun. So that would be, you know, I don't know. Jesus dies in thirty thirty three. John. It depends. Some scholars say that John dies by one hundred. Well, they say yeah. that the Gospel of John is written in one hundred. So it's unclear whether it's this John that wrote it. Or another John, right? Put away. Put aside the question of did it happen or not. Like, right. we're, we're, let's assume that it did. If it did, John would probably have been a young, maybe a teenager or something. Because when if you're if you're going to tell somebody, here's your new son, you're not going to tell it to an old man. Mm -hmm. say, if like like for example, he's on the cross and he look at he's looking at his mom and he sees one of his disciples who's. He's gonna choose the one who's the youngest to be. Hey, here's your new son. Like mother, here, son, here's your new mother. You're not gonna find the the 75 year old man and say, here, here's your new son. That's it's gonna right. be the young one. So it would it would make sense that he was a young boy when Jesus was around, and then sort of like carried on this tradition to a different place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we are okay. So. Academically speaking, Jesus is said to have three biological brothers, James, John, Philip, and two sisters. Um, it's unclear what, so James seems to be the old, the, the older after Jesus, right? So Jesus is first. There are some people that argue that uh, these are John, uh, John, Joseph's children. And then Mary comes along and she has Jesus. There's that argument. Um, but most, uh, I don't want to put them all under the same umbrella, but most scholars will say Jesus is first. And then of course, Mary and Joseph would have had children like everyone else. So John is, I, I can't tell if he's between James and Philip or, I mean, there's no real evidence for this. This is more like a guess, an academic guess. So I've heard people, I've heard people make the case that he was a twin, that he was a twin, which is I very, which is very odd because it's like. If he's a twin, then what's up with the other brother? What's going on? Like, yeah, you know, he just didn't get any. He just wasn't. I don't know. I've heard that before, though. Um, uh, I, I don't know what the, that from. I don't know what the. I can't, remember, I can't remember who was who said that, but they're. I think it might have been Bart Ehrman, actually. Oh, I love who Bart. Said, so who okay. said something like like this is obviously all the stuff that we're saying. None of this is proven. No. Like we don't. We can't like find like a rock somewhere that says all this stuff. This is all. We're all just like look reading between the lines and trying to. And some people are not, I just don't like that. Some people are just yes. like, I need to see like a videotape of this stuff for it to be real. I'm, you know. I'm not one of those people. I like to take things with a grain of salt, but I also like to take things at face value too, because yes. it's fun to deal with it. We're, we're dealing with these texts yes. and like, sometimes it's, I just, I'll just assume as much as possible just to get to a certain place. And then we can discuss those things. Yes. That's basically what I'm saying here. But yes. with all that being said, the fact that he would have family and these are the people who are carrying on traditions makes sense. Who else is going to do it? Yes. You know? Yes. And, you know, if we look at the Virgin Mary as a, a normal Jewish girl, um, I mean, before the infancy gospel of James, when the, when she becomes this deified vision in Theotokos, if we just look at her as a historical figure, which she would have been a Jewish girl, 14, 16, however old, you know, and she, there would be no reason for her not to have other children it, within the Jewish faith, right? There was nothing that would have said, no, this is the only one. It, it, historically, it doesn't make sense. So it would have made sense that they would have created a family. And the fact that Joseph is so old is a much later story, right? That's yeah. a much later story. Um, and so Joseph... Yeah, Joseph, been, Joseph doesn't show up in the text until the second gospel that's written and Paul never mentions Joseph. No. And he never meant, you know, what's really fascinating about Paul is he never mentions a virgin birth. Right. He, ne I mean, you think he, I mean, he would have had that been the situation. If that was the big deal. Yeah. Why right. Like Paul would not have let go of that. You know, I don't know if you know, my mentor for my PhD, his name is Barry, L Barry Wilson. 
Um, he wrote a book, How Jesus Became Christian, which is a fantastic thing on Paul. He's like an expert on Paul. And one of the things that we always have these discussions about Paul is like, what was Paul's marketing strategy? And had he known had he heard of a virgin birth for Jesus, that would have been a guarantee he would have been talking about it. But I think because Paul was Jewish himself, he understood Jesus as another historical figure and like within his own community and realized that I don't think he would have thought that, oh my God, we have to add a virgin birth. I think Paul really relied on that vision that he had. Yeah. And he didn't say anything about Mary. In fact, it doesn't, you know, he doesn't mention their specialty, like her how special she might be and, you know, her connection to nothing. Um, so that yeah. tells us, that's how we read history, right? We got, like you said, we read between the lines because of well, someone like Paul thought that Jesus was coming back immediately. Right. So he wasn't even really documenting a history. Yeah. Now right? I want to go back to where, to what you were saying about Ephesus and John. Cause uh, my, I have a question is, do you think that, if say John relocates to Ephesus, mm -hmm. he goes to this city and maybe he's Jewish and he doesn't know much about Artemis. He shows mm -hmm. up to the city and he mm -hmm. sees this is a temple of Artemis. Everyone here worships Artemis. This, she's the big deal here. And what do you, how do you, do you think he's contributing to the idea of Mary becoming like Artemis? Because, it, you know, what do you think happens? Or, or is that just, that's just way too speculative? Uh, okay. And this is just my personal opinion based on some, you know, the research. I don't think that John thought of Mary as a divine being. Of his right. Own. So I... It's going to be typical for someone who's of Jewish faith. They're not... Right? I don't They're not deifying that... people. They're... No. They're mono, it's very monotheistic. Maybe... Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that um, he expected that she would be Theotokos even. I don't think, so that wasn't, that didn't seem to be in the language at all. And if we are looking at the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John barely mentions uh, Jesus at all. There's no, and actually in the Gospel of John, there's no infancy uh, story. So again, another question, if the Gospel of John is written by John the Apostle, maybe john the brother of jesus why is there no mention of a virgin birth right like so, so, so it's probably this is probably a tradition that develops over time right yes in the in the infancy gospel of james the the proto evangelium of james uh which is way later like in 175 or 140 that is really where this is the fan fiction that that really lays the foundation for the virgin mary and her story read the infancy gospel of james ever yes right yes, yes. isn't it it's very weird it's very it's like it that's why i call it fan, fan fiction i know people are like but even the church calls it fan fiction. i mean they don't use that language yeah i think a lot of those second century texts would be yeah safe they say that. like you know this isn't really a truth but it was a very popular fiction whatever but it was so popular if you think about it it was so popular that two thousand years later we still use it as the source of our christmas celebrations of our belief in the mary as a virgin uh pre-birth and after birth uh it like challenges all all scientific logic that we know and yet people have a lot of faith in this particular document so i yeah. think that's the document that really created this deity and i think that that document even though it doesn't say in the document itself, used like Roman mythology to create to shape this character. That's right. To shape, now, shape her there, and all that. Is there anything in that text that you think pops out Artemis, -y, Artemis or Diana or a, a lot. So oh, okay. yeah, a lot because not necessarily, well, maybe Artemis, -y, but the, so the fact like things like, um, well, Mary has a special birth right? Like she herself has a virgin birth. I'm oh, sorry, an immaculate conception. 
So when we talk about the Immaculate Conception, we actually refer to the conception of Mary in the infancy gospel of James, right? Because Sarah can't have her mother, Sarah or Anna? Oh my God. For John? A uh, um, uh, Mary's mother. I think it's Sarah. Or maybe oh, it's yeah. I know Sarah is, I think it's, it's no, I'm confused. Because Sarah is the wife of Abraham. But she might have right. the same name, though. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Ma so Mary. she, uh, where am I? But so Mary has a special birth because her mother can't get pregnant, right? Yeah. She's older, too. It's that repetition of the Abraham story. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we, so we call Mary's birth, the Virgin Mary's birth, an immaculate conception because the father is away and the angel comes to her mother and says, um, you know, you're going to have this, you're going to give birth to this girl, this baby girl, and you're going to name her Mary. And the baby girl is going to be the body that carries like God. Hmm. You know what I mean? So there's this long prophecy that he gives her. It's not just that you're going to have a baby girl and this is a miracle, but this baby girl is going to have another miracle and it's going to be Jesus, right? Um, so in that way, I think that that Mary's magic birth connects to a lot of the, the different births of goddesses, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Artemis is born from Leto. I'm not sure that that's that miraculous. I'm not sure that there's any argument that Leto remains a virgin. I don't think the Greeks really thought like that, you know, or even right. the Romans, right? But then Mary in the infancy gospel of games is treated like a little goddess. She only takes like seven steps on the earth before she's picked up and carried by angels and fed by virgins. Then she's supposedly taken to the temple. I mean, early Christians in the second century must have thought that the Jewish temple had a daycare. Like, you know what I mean? Like they knew nothing. They, they knew nothing because it's like, oh, then her parents take her to the temple and drop her off at two or three years old. You know what I mean? And like all these priests um, are, are doing what? The, the taking care of this baby girl? How? Where? You know? Um, but they know that she's really special. And then again, she's fed by angels and taken care of by other virgins. And she's lived in, so she's like living on sacred ground. So there's something about that they want to say about Mary that her body, her physical body is divine in a way. It's, it's so sacred. And in that way, I think it touches on the bodies of goddesses, particularly virginal goddesses that are untouched by men, not looked at by men, you know, not walking around on common ground that are up in a limb, you know. Um, Artemis sits on her father's lap and demands for all these things. You know, when she's a little kid, she's like, I want the nymphs and I want all the wilderness and I want all these things and you have to give them to me. And her father gives it to her. And in a way, Mary is treated also like a queen, like a princess from when she's a baby. So there's that sort of overlap. Uh, the problem, of course, comes when Mary has, you know, becomes... Uh, close to getting her period. And then all the priests freak out because they're now the sacred being that has been raised by angels is going to defile the temple with her blood, right? That's why they give I her explosive. Right? forgot about that part, yeah. yeah. So they, they're all freaking out. They're like, oh my God, Mary has become 12 or whatever she is. And uh, what are we going to do about her because she's going to defile the temple? And so they come up with this idea of let's gather all the old men in the village who apparently can't have children anymore. I mean, this is the story. And they're going to put their staff. They literally draw straws. They're going to put their staffs all in the middle. And so they all hold their staffs. And we're told that from Joseph's staff comes a dove. And that's how they know that Joseph must now take this child that is about to menstruate at some point to his home. And of course, Joseph is an old man. And he comes and he says in this story, not the Bible, he right. says, yeah. Uh, Oh, I'm an old man. I have already have children. I'm a widower. What do I need to, you know, what do I need this 12 year old kid for? And then they're like, God has put you in charge of her, blah, blah. Then they very specifically make sure that they say he takes her to her home, his home and leaves. He leaves for four years to build houses. Right. So once again, she remains untouched in that way. Again, she's like a divine body. Right. She's like a, she is kind of like a goddess in a sense. She's untouchable and untouched. And that's what, and that's what Artemis 
is kind of known for is being the vir- well, she gets that title virgin first of all. Yes. Parthenos. Yes. And she's known for not having like a male counterpart or like That's a husband right. or anything. She's That's just right. the virgin goddess. And 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 unmarried because the Virgin Mary is not technically married to Joseph in this text. Yeah. In the Bible, it's unclear because, you know, marriages were not the way we think of marriages today, right? I mean, rich people got married. People didn't always get married. Um, now, I want to say something about that, though, because yeah. somebody might be sitting there saying that yeah, the text is so late. It's not part of the canon. Who cares? But first of all, that text would have been just as important or relative when it, in its time period had it been two centuries before the canon was you know a, a, even a thing before that word canon even was no one even knew what that word was until fourth century that's right that text would have been very important in fact uh tony burke who i've had on my channel said it was really famous like it was people took it seriously it was like yes, yes. and not and also historically there might be some truth behind it because um, I've talked to other scholars who say that, you know, Joseph, the fact that he just doesn't, sh- he's shows up in the, like a little, just like little tiny areas and then he's gone and he's nowhere to be seen for the crucifixion scene, which means he probably was dead. He probably was an old man. And he probably died when Jesus was, was in his thirties. He's probably dead before that. Mm-hmm. Or, and so if that's the case, then you're thinking like, well, maybe it is kind of, maybe he did sort of like take on her caretaker role and if if that is the case and there's another tradition and this is in the talmud actually this is on the jewish side that says that jesus's real father biological father was a roman soldier named pantera i've heard that that story and that so yeah and so that's joseph isn't the real father he's just sort of this that sort of plays into this whole idea of Yes. Whether you think that or not, but like what I'm what I'm getting at is ju- the basically what I'm, the point I'm making here is the 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 narrative of Joseph being an older male taking on a young Mary seems to be like I don't know why you would doubt that is what I'm saying. I think there's some truth to that. Ah, uh, I see. Um, hmm. I think there's a pro and con. I I think that it wouldn't have been unusual for an older man to take a younger woman as a wife for sure, no doubt. I think the way that it's presented in the in the gospel in the infancy gospel of James, though, is that there's sort of this lottery happening among these older men, and that they're taking her um, because there's already a prediction about her being the sacred body, and so they're taking her not as a wife, but to protect. And so I so I that would have been a bit unusual. Um, because usually if that was the case, women would go to their own the males in their families. So her father, uh, obviously she doesn't have brothers. Um, so I guess there's, it's uncertain whether or not Joseph is old. However, even the gospels themselves, um, I can't remember if it's Matthew or Luke, but um, there is one of the gospels that traces Jesus's um, connection to uh, David through Mary. And the other one, because there's only two infancies, the other one traces his connection to David through Joseph. Right. So I think that there may have been stories in which Joseph is an average age, maybe not 14, but at least 30, let's say. It's like something that's more of an average male age, an older man. And he's married to or with uh, Mary as people were. Um I don't know where the Roman story comes in. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not an expert in that part of the Talmud. Um, we'd have to like look at the times, whether it comes before, what I mean, whether it comes before or after the infancy gospel of James, because if it's it actually, it actually that, would have been before that. And the reason, that. the reason why we know that is because Celsus yeah. that cites this text in the middle of the second century. Mm. So in, at, at, Maybe like right, either right before or contemporary with, huh. it would have been around the same time. Because huh. Celsus is living in the middle of the second century, yeah, and he says in his text, um, I forgot the name of the text, but we have the uh, we have like fragments preserved, and and the he says he cites the Jewish sources for this. Says 
His, mm-hmm. We know who his father was. It was a Jewish soldier named Pantera. He wasn't a ver- like he's like cracking jokes and like being very critical of Christianity in huh. this text and saying like it's not that important. He's just a he uh, blah 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 blah. And yeah. he was like he but but he says specifically says that his source is the Jewish some Jewish source or something. Mm. And the Talmud and this is interesting too because the Talmud doesn't get compiled. Like the sources that are in the Talmud are all different dates. Some of them are first century, some of them are second century, but it doesn't get compiled to like the fourth century. Right. So you're like, what sources Kels is even talking about? No one really knows. All we know is what he said. Right. Like, but that's but I but it does show that 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 legend is pretty early on. Yeah. Second century is pretty early. You know. So that story was probably running around or going around. At least in the Jewish community, it was going around, and maybe right. the early Christians, I guess, depends. Because I, yeah, I've heard that story, but it doesn't make it into any of the other stories, which is really the Christians don't want to deal. I don't think the Christians like that much. No, no, it's too, it's too, it's too, uh, it's too real. It's too, yes, you know, yes, yes, and and I think that after that, after the second century, they really need her to be They really need a miraculous birth. Well, they need a miraculous birth to sell Christianity, anyways, because you know the Romans are interested in something that's like mythical right they're not interested in your prophet that was born and lived like a normal man and had kids and was just talking about things like they want something mystical right so by the time they're looking for a religion to replace their religion to kind of unite the empire which is like the third century they're looking for something that has magic you know um so i don't yeah i don't think that nobody would have cared if he was just the son of some dude. No, why? They, <laughs> you can't be God if you're just a son of some dude. You know? Right, right, right. Because because you're right. He got as time goes on, he gets more and more God. Wow. He gets more and more God attributes, and now now that the church is he is God. Like there's no separation anymore where in the early early on in the early sources there's separation between him and the creator and whatever yeah. and uh and actually I, f- I, f- I found this out recently there was a there was a gnostic sect valentinians i almost forgot the name it's the valentinians they their trinity consisted of mary father and jesus mm-hmm. so it wasn't just like so there's some trinities that just kind of put mary aside and it's right it's the holy spirit which you know it's something different but th- these particular christians actually just said that's it's mary yes mother yes. or the the mother mother of jesus as the yes third part of the trinity and you know this and then this bring, brings us back to ephesus because this is where that debate took place for her to become theotokos because it was nestorius versus Cyril. And, you know, Cyril had this this belief in the incarnation that was very different, obviously, than Nestorius. And so then they started having this debate uh, about the incarnation. So is the incarnation... Let me see, how does it go again? So is Jesus the embodiment of God? Like, is God Jesus? Therefore, if God is Jesus and he's in Mary's body... That means that Mary carried a God. Or, as Nestorius says, Jesus is a representative of God, a human representative of God. Um, And therefore, Mary just carried a man who's a representative of God, uh, but she is not Theotokos. And uh, and then this, this huge battle happened in 431 in Ephesus. Uh, where Nestorius and Cyril, I mean, they had been going at it for a while uh, with letters, but when they got to Ephesus, they had almost, almost like a full out fight, a full out physical fight, you know, over this instance. And so if like the Catholics believe that Jesus is God embodied, then you cannot deny that the body of Mary carried a God. Then the question becomes, well, what makes the body of Mary so special that she can carry a God. 
right? And then that connects us back to Dionysus and other gods that were carried, well, not that many gods that were carried by, or demigods that were carried by human women. Um, and so then Mary becomes one of these and she becomes Theotokos, which is the mother of God. And so then people start asking this question, like, is the mother of God more important than God himself? You know, like, I think that the fear is that Mary, and a lot of people accuse Catholics, of course, of being Mary worshipers or Mary worshipers, right, right. right? Because, I mean, the mother of God, what, what place does the mother of God hold? Well, you see this in, it's Byzantines too, not just the Catholic, the Greek Orthodox too, mm -hmm. because they, and, and um, some of these early, some of these like middle age texts, like you'll see like, randomly it'll be like a letter from someone to someone else and it'll say like i hope mary gives me what i need in this in this fight in this endeavor yes like they like mary becomes a synonym a synonym for god yes. like mother mary give please mother mary help us like like you you this is she's part of the godhead in yes. a lot of in a lot of these traditions yes I mean, I would argue she would be the Godhead in a way. Because yeah, you see her can, image in the churches. Right. Then you can make the argument that has there had there been no Mary, would there had been a Jesus? Like, it causes, it creates, uh, I can see why people like Nestorius was very opposed to it, because it creates this, it, it sort of brings Jesus in equal parring with the Virgin Mary. It, and it elevates her to goddess symbol. And then because she's the only woman in the pantheon of Christians, she embodies all the goddess aspects. So, I mean, this, I, I don't, you know, I think for most of us, this is a logical next step and, and questions. Um, but it seems that in Ephesus, they were, and cer certainly Cyril was so, he was so powerful and influential that he pushed through and the Ephesians were so committed to naming her Theotokos in their city that there was, you know, there's some, some um, in some of the letters, there's this, uh, there's this almost a sense of, of fear. Like if we don't make her Theotokos, there will be a revolution. Like there seems to be this kind of like, there's a lot of um, heat coming up. People are angry. People are questioning. People are defending. So in the letters, there seems to be this kind of, tension that's that's boiling up and my argument was that in fact the ephesians had because they had the goddess for so long they saw this as an opportunity to grasp another goddess in their city and kind of continue that tradition and so they pushed almost violently for her to be named theotokos and once she was named theotokos she became goddess i mean arguably yeah um and I'm looking at some of these uh, early Ephesian church fathers because Christianity really is a product, especially in the second century. It's a product of Asia Minor in a lot of ways. Yes. Like culturally, a lot of the early Christians come from this region. And like Ephesus is right in the middle of this area where Christianity explodes. And a lot of, a lot of these early Christian church fathers, they've really like Mary's a huge deal in the theology. I mean, she's like, she's just like, like, like I said, like I mentioned before, so she's, her name is synonymous with the, with God. Like, like you, when you're like, it's in the prayers and everything. Like you see it. Uh, I mean, could yeah. we argue that had there been no Mary, Jesus and Christianity had not been as popular? I mean, yeah, because I think you can, had he not had a miraculous birth what else i think also because she kind of fills in the role religion wise of for like the goddess yes and i, I think that's a big role like i i think you can't like you know, the, the the whole roman world is full filled, filled with gods and goddesses and then yeah. as like as it slowly over time starts to become more christian uh there that 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 like there's something there needs to be something to fill that role and that's mary that's what Mary does, you know. Yeah, and you know the Christians. The Christians really like using the the Mary, Mary as that second e the second coming of Eve. There's the cleansing of the sins of Eve. There's a sort of 
she becomes, I mean, that is a really goddess thing to do in a sense of like, she's there's salvation through her uh, for women and men, right? Like she saves, she's a big, she has a lot of, she has a big savior energy, right? She saves people. Um, she communicates with people. So she's really that intermediary because she's always, she's showing up in visions more than Jesus ever does. Right. right. She comes to people more, her statues bleed more. Um, yeah. Right. Like, She's what is that? What is the etymology for Theodicus? The mother of God. So Theodicus comes from Theo, of course, the God, right? So it's, it translates into the mother of God oh. or mother, mother of God. Mother of God. So that's a God. now. Is that is that title? Do we see that with any other gods, goddesses? I mean, or we do not. Well, okay. okay, we don't see it for Artemis because because the gods. I mean, we could argue that Gaia is a Theotokos. We could argue, like, we could argue that there are a lot of mothers of gods in the pantheons, but because they're already gods, that's a given. I think what makes Mary unique is the fact that she's human and given this title. So I would argue that there are no other humans in, let's say, Greco Roman history that have this title, that carry this title, or would be seen as a parent of a god other than Dionysus's mother. But of course she dies, right? She dies this, you know, terrible death. Um, and then Zeus becomes the father of God. So there's a, there's a there's a weird thing happening there. So Mary, I think, is the only human, or some people argue the last human to have a virginal birth, but to become a mother of God. I can't think of another Theotokos as, as, as a human in the Greco-Roman culture. Um yeah. Other than, like I said, Dionysus' mother would qualify, but she's not called that. She's, I've never heard to, of her being referred to that way. Um, yeah, is that my Semele? Yes. Yeah, because I think Semele actually means like Earth, earth Mother, like, or uh, I forgot what it, I forget, I think it right now. It's, but it's something to do with like mortal Earth. Right. Something right. to do with that. Yeah. So Theotokos is even, is even higher than that. So Theotokos, like, I have no doubt that Theotokos literally means like goddess in the sense of uh, not literally, sorry, that's wrong, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's like, it's the, it's a deification. Yes. Type. That's a good, better word. It is a yeah. deification of Mary. Yeah. And I think that Cyril wanted that. He wanted that because it gives validity to Jesus as the embodied divinity that came to earth. Right. And so that's what he really wanted. He didn't, I don't know that he, I mean, he really was a misogynist. He didn't like women very much. So I don't know that he thought that this would really blow up the way it does 2000 years later kind of thing or throughout the next 2000 years. But I think that he was from his letters, he was really, really adamant at making sure that Jesus is um, seen as, as a walking God, a breathing God on earth, you know? God incarnated, um, and I think that was the, his real push, and and he got that. He got that what he wanted. But I think, like most history, <laughs> the goddess also got her day in court kind of thing. You know, she always had. She gets her little okay. You think you're taking over, but really, I'm still here kind of thing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. What about the um what do you think about like the image any images of Artemis or Diana um comparing those to those images of Mary? Do you so, see any My favorite comparison is of the uh dark stone. So what we call the black Madonnas and the black Artemis. Oh yeah. So that. so that is a really direct correlation um between Mary and Artemis and it has a lot to do with um, this idea of like earthy mother uh, the black stone so the black stone is sometimes seen as a meteorite so early black stone goddesses were made out of meteorite that had fallen from the sky and so they were thought to have like magical powers or you know I don't know the, the, the kind of feels that meteorites have and so then that became a trend to create dark stoned um, 
goddesses and the dark stoned Madonna, the black Madonna. And then people argue, there's some scholars that argue that the dark stone represents like the earthiness of the goddess, the womb, really? the dark. Yeah. Like, so there's a lot there's of. Sem we were just talking about this too, and I just looked it up. Semele has that etymology of earth. Yeah. Earth mother. Not surprised. Yeah. Huh. But, anyways, that's different. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think because there's something there's something there about the cosmic womb you know it, it feels like it goes back to i remember when i went to athens one time to this museum they had these i call them like fry pan artifacts but they don't have them anymore um and they were these black stone artifacts and they looked like a fry pan and inside the artifact itself, and you can't even find them online. I remember seeing entire walls of them, but we couldn't take pictures of them because they had discovered them and then they probably stuck them in the back room somewhere. Um, but each one of these black stones inside had like some kind of image of like a city or like a house or a deer or whatever. And then as the, as the pan kind of narrows down here, it had like this pubic triangle, which is that first symbol of humanity. And this idea that the black stone represents the womb and the cosmic womb, the womb of the universe. And then if and that's, you know, these are Neolithic pieces. So if we move forward 3000 years, 4000 years, we still see that there is this mystery around black stone and how black stone still continues to represent like cosmic deity, but in darkness. Do you know what I mean? Not like bright light, not like. The way we think about like halo lights or like, you know, uh, sparkling vampires or something. Today, we tend to think about divinities as sparkling, as shiny. But there was a time when people thought about divinities as like dark, cosmic, night, you know, womb. Yeah. And so it's not an accident that the Black Madonnas are found uh, throughout the world. Um, some people say they're dug out of the earth. You know, there's legends around them mm -hmm. and that there are miracles around them. There's a lot of miracles around them in South America. There's a lot of miracles in France. You know, there's lots of miracles around them. And then the, I, the interesting thing is that there is a, a, a really great, I'm just pulling it up there, but you could probably pull it up too. There's a really great statue of Artemis of Ephesus in this black stone. So her hands and feet are black and her face is black stone, right? Um, which as a side note, I argue that this proves that her, the, the stuff on her chest is not boobs because had it been boobs, they would have also been black stone, but okay. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good point. <laughs> right? um, so that is, an, that is like a visual connection, but it's more than visual because it's artistry. Someone is taking the time to make Artemis in this black stone and then someone is taking the time to make um, Mary in this black stone. So it's, it's almost like a a creative connection. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a lot there. And that's, but that makes, so do you think the, now, no, okay. That's, that's interesting for Mary. Do you see anything like that with uh, Artemis other than the one that you were just describing? Is there other, any other black stone images of Artemis? Isn't there a, isn't, is I'm not mistaken? Isn't there a Roman version? That's the um, one. That's, that's the one the you're one. talking about. Okay. That's the one. Um, so it's a later version, which is, it works for Mary because. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's later. It's, it's closer to Mary. Right. Um, it shows, it shows the borrowing of ideas. That's right. That's right. The Latin, if, um, if the Roman Latins that are still pagans are depicting Artemis in the same way as these Christians are, that says something about the times. Right. Right. So that way it works. But going backwards, it's the only black stone that we found so far of Artemis. Certainly, I don't expect it of the Greek Artemis, you know, the Huntress representation, which, I mean, again, I take that for granted because I don't expect it, but I don't expect it because the Artemis of Ephesus has a mothering nature. And so, of course, I expect her to be in Blackstone because it is about, it's about creating, it's about the cosmic womb, where the, art, the Greek Artemis as a Huntress would not be in Blackstone because she's not seen as like a cosmic womb. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the Artemis of Ephesus, really, because she's so influenced by Kybele. In fact, I would argue she takes over the, the Anatolian Kybele. Well, really? The Greeks, 
yeah i mean the greeks I and mean, that's and that's the great mother and yes it's very easy to to to, to compare the great mother to this mary yes mother mary figure they both have this a lot a lot of overlap happening there yes and yes. so if artemis is literally taking on the great mother role yes then i'm not then then I, then we can go from there to not being surprised if there's overlap between artemis and mary you know what i mean yes so in this book that i'm writing neil so what happened okay I want to I want to do a short chronology. So the Anatolian Kybele is here and uh, there and in, in Anatolia, let's say, and in, in Ephesus, and predates. I think one of the oldest um, carvings that we have of her is inside a outside of a cave wall, uh, outside of a cave on a wall. It's like sixth century BCE. It's very very old, and she's sitting down with her lions. So yeah, yeah, that's the famous one, right? So we know that she was in this area. And so what a lot of scholarship shows is that as the Greeks took over this area, because Kaibali was not just mother of the gods, but of the wilderness and mistress of animals, the Greeks went, oh, yeah, we have one of those. Her name is Artemis. And so there is this transition in which Artemis takes over Kaibali's role. However, for some reason, the Greeks could not deter the Ephesians from adapting their Greek Artemis or their, their, their concept to Kybele in the sense of like the statue of Artemis at Ephesia still carries a lot of Kybele's characteristics. So it was almost like a push and pull tension for a thousand years while the Greeks are trying to impose their traditions and those that were already indigenous to this area are trying to maintain their, their traditions. And the Artemis of Ephesus is a compromise of that push and pull. So then you can say that's the, if that's the natural progression of culture, you can then it would, it's just all it is is another step to add Mary into this evolution of culture. And so if Mary's jumping and filling in that role, the same role that the great mother always played for a long time, and then Artemis jumps in, and then Mary. Yes. Wow. Yes. I would say that the, the, the slight difference is that Artemis becomes heavily associated with bees, um, and like heavily associated with bees. So again, this is cultural adaptation. Yeah, the, the, the Ephesus coins always have bees on them. Right, there's lots of bee. Uh, so this is again, cultural development. Uh, Kybele is not as associated with bees. Um, not that she isn't, but there's a strong association with Artemis. And and Mary takes a lot of that. Like Mary is often referred to as the honeybee, the virgin bee. So I would say that there is a bit of a step well, I guess, I mean, what you're saying is true, too. If you take Mary sort of in pieces and pull back, you could see Kybele, of course. But I think that they kind of, you know, those videos where they have the Greek gods dancing now? They're like a big thing on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know how they shape, they change shapes, right? I yeah. kind of feel like that would be perfect for what happens between Kybele, Artemis, and Mary. It's like wow. they, you know, they're kind of dancing. Yeah, they them. bleed into each other. They, yeah. They, 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 and that's what it, it's like. They, it's an evolution of. Yes. I call of, it a fusion. Like, you know. Fusion, yeah. Like a, yeah, there's like a. It's complementary um, and it's organic in many ways. Mm. It's easily traceable. It's really beautiful, actually, because it's a type of survival in a way. Like, it is survival. Um it's the only way the goddess could survive. But what's really fascinating about that is that the people are doing all of these or are maintaining all of these characteristics. So then what that tells us is that there's something about us that we feel attached to certain symbols like the bee, like milk, like mothering, like breastfeeding, like whatever, you know, um, and so we really, it seems like we really want or need a divine feminine because it's like, this is the last one, let's say in this, you know, in Christianity and like people are holding on to her for dear life and, and, and have created this magnificent being. You know, when I was a kid, Mary was my everything. Like the Virgin Mary was my everything. Right. Cause I mean, I grew up very Catholic. Um, 
And then when I went to school and I broke with that tradition, it really broke my heart to like have to contend with the fact that that was actually sort of a fan fiction story that Mary was probably a woman who just gave birth to a guy who was probably a fantastic guy. Uh, and so I had to really contend with that. And then when I, then I still kind of felt called to the goddess. And it's really only recently where I've been sitting there thinking like, man, I really wish I spent my childhood worshiping the goddess the way I think about her today. And then I think, but I did. Oh, I see. But it was just, it was in the, it was in the only option that I had as a kid growing up in a very Catholic household, you know, it's and almost like it, I don't know if you're familiar with Carl Jung, but it's almost like the, his, his archetypes. His right. There's that great mother archetype. It doesn't really matter what you call it. it doesn't matter if it's Mary or if it's Kaibali, but it still fills as long as it's filling that role psychologically. It's the needs are being met. Yeah. Because these are the he 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 was big into like these things can heal you. Like these are like these ideas are like meant to like be invoked or you know, useful in ways where it actually like helps out your psyche. Like, you know, yes. What I mean? yes. And you know, the, the, the other things that connect Artemis and Mary are things like their titles. So Mary, uh, Artemis is often called the goddess of the first throne. Mary is often called the queen of heaven. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, even though Artemis has no children, there's this concept that she is the mother of the Ephesians. And she feeds them and takes care of them. And of course, Mary is is the mother. Um, and then they have these characteristics that are similar. Uh, they have these characteristics as the core redemptrix, like we talked about before, where Artemis has Apollo and Mary has Jesus. So they have this sort of dual relationships or dual leadership where they share leadership. Um, and so they have these unique characteristics that really connect them to um i mean people have used mary to i mean if you think about it how many goddesses could really be connected to, i mean you can't really connect athena too much to mary perhaps demeter a little bit but i'm not sure um hera nee. um and so there so isis like you said you had a conversation with someone about isis because isis i think is the is the one of the, the most clear connections because Isis is holding Horus in the same way that eventually Mary holds. Right, the is, divine child birth, yeah. Yeah, that's a very clear, um, what do you call it? Visual, visualization, right? Um, so there are a few God, it's interesting actually now that I'm thinking about You also that. have Dionysus's first incarnation who where he's, his mother is Persephone. Yeah, that's true. So, and, and I, I know some people compare that Persephone to Isis being yes. the queen of the underworld. And so Isis being, you know, married to Osiris, who's the king of the underworld. And there's like that. So it's, it's crazy. There's a lot. The overlaps are interesting because it's not one to one. Yeah. It's, it's, this God doesn't equal that God. I hate when people do that. I used yeah. to do it all the time. Then I, when I started learning more. Now I'm like, wow, I, I, yeah. I really, that's like, you can't do that. Yeah. Every God is their own God. Yeah. There is overlaps, yes. but sometimes you'll see, like, the uh, the best example is this. Diodorus of Sicily tries to compare Osiris and Bacchus. You know, there's a lot of these, like, people, some people say that they're, they're the same god or whatever. But, like, when you think about it, di they're, yeah, okay, I get why they do that. They both have, like, the connection to the vine and grapes and uh, um, they're both, like, fertility or uh, whatever. But Osiris also is like a Pluto and because he's the king of the underworld. Yeah. And you can't like it's it's like there's overlaps between certain gods. So, like one god can look like two different gods at the same time, and then another god can have overlap with this god. But yeah. that then this god has nothing in common with that god. And there's like a triangle going on here. Yeah. Like you see that happening with these. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. I think because we we live in a society or in a culture or a globe where people have categorized and boxed gods. Yes. And the ancients didn't live like that. No. You know, uh, they had, they could do this like three or four or five dimensional thinking at the same time. Right. You know, they right. can go, right? Like they could go from village to village and understand that Artemis is called, you know, something here and called something here and called something here and represent like a wolf or a bear or a tiger or whatever. But still it's the same divinity. Like they could do yeah. this. 
sense. They saw they saw it like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe perhaps because they they understood that the gods are part of the village stories of the tribal stories. Yes. You know, like almost like they saw that gods fit into the human lives and they and they represent nature itself too yeah so like a sun a sun god in one place is called something but it might be called something else in another place but it's still the sun god yeah so they're like oh they, yeah we call it helios or they call it this and they call it horus yeah. over there but they but so they see like the connection between in nature yeah or so or like oh this god is represented by the star saturn yeah. oh so is this god okay so maybe they're the same like they do they do yeah. the connections that way yeah I think that they were a lot more advanced in their thinking about spirituality than we are yeah. um, because they lived in this sort of multidimensional world with many, many different gods and they allowed their gods the freedom to shift and change. And they didn't go like, oh no, this is my Artemis, right? Right, um, the dogma wasn't really there. It was more, yeah. more free. Yeah. And so I often fantasize about living in those times and participating in those social too, yeah. because it's it's hard for us sometimes to get our to wrap our minds around how expanded their thought was and so and how chill they were about it like oh you have a story about Artemis too and she does this here oh that's cool you know and people will always say when you when you fantasize about living in like the you know ancient greece or something people will say you know how hard life was back then you can't just pull out your phone or the food you got to go and make the food like all right yeah fair point fair point but can you still imagine walking through athens in like 400 bc imagine the columns imagine the art imagine the imagine how amazing that would look and feel to be there yeah like you can't i don't care what you say about hard living you cannot tell me that it wouldn't be amazing to take a walk through athens yeah 2500 years ago and i, I mean, mean i think it'd be yeah. yeah and i mean the processions they had even for artemis for example they had this big procession on the 6th of may for her birthday in ephesus but i mean it was like a massive party that was funded by the government. And so each each senator, each person, each emperor, each whoever came to power was trying to outdo the last one by how many things they would give to Artemis and to the people. So how much food they give, how much wine they give, free clothes, free entertainment, blah, blah, blah. Yep. So it's such a different world. You wanted to be famous in that sense. So you try, right. you're trying to outdo the person before you so you can be have that like fame and glory of this That's was right. a great leader, you know? That's right. And in fact, they talk about how in Ephesus, the 6th of May is like equal, would be equal to our Christmas. Oh, like, really? It was such a mass. It was like a month of preparation and parties and food and all these and sacrifices and things. And then on the 6th of May, it's her actual birthday. And so then that would be like Christmas Day, wow. you know? Uh, and people would have the entire month off. Right to prepare, to celebrate, to purify, to do whatever. What was the name of that um, festival? Do you remember? Do you know? So it is on Ar Artemisia, right? I think it's the Artemisian. It's I know it's the they go by Ortigia. No, I think it's just the Artemisian festival on May sixth. Um, I can't remember the the Greek name for May. Uh, Me neither. I have no idea because I know the, the there's different calendars depending on what time period. Yeah, so they know. have. Yeah, they have a, what do you call it? Yeah, so, but but that was her birthday because they actually argued that she was born in Ortigia, the Ephesian Artemis. So, you know how she's supposed to be born at Delos for the Greeks? Yeah. The, the Ephesians actually gave her another birthplace near them. Oh, I see. So they, That's also like how there's two different Mount Idas. Like right. the people that were living in Crete, they had their own Mount Ida story. Yeah. And they, it's Mount Ida, it's right there. Then you go to then you go to uh, Phrygia. Yeah. Yeah, my Ida, it's right here. What are you talking about? It's not in Crete. <laughs> and it's the same. It's they have the same mythology, but it's the same mountain, but it's in a different location. It's yeah, funny. yeah. And I think yeah. Olympus was like that too. I think there's a bunch of different Olympuses, but there are different uh, places for where Olympus could be. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's funny. And you know what's really interesting? I was just reading some of my stuff today, and I came across this this story of this image of Mary in this catacomb, in this Roman catacomb, and she has horns. Wow. 
And so I thought, oh my God. Uh, and so I apparently- to find that one. Mary yeah. Warren's? Yeah, so they say, okay, hold on. Um, so as early as the second and third century and overlapping the Roman revival of black Artemis Ephesia. So apparently there was already black Artemis Ephesia, but we don't have any surviving. Wow, I'm finding paintings of her and horns too. Yeah? I just found a painting of Mary and Jesus both with horns. I'm not you, surprised. You want to see this? Yes. I'm trying to find out. I'm going to see who, who painted this. It looks like a renaissance. Uh, okay. Peter of Verona, 1206. 1206. Yeah, that's it. Look at this. It's This is amazing. I, I, I'm i saving this one. I'm going to use this in some of my videos from now on. Uh, here it is. I'll show you one second. This is great. I don't know what it is about horns. I just like them. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, like, since I've done that episode, oh, I've this? just been noticing them everywhere. Yeah. Um, Wait, can I not save this or something? Oh, I can share my screen. That's what I can do. Okay. Check this out. See the horns? Oh, my God. Jesus, too. <laughs> so this wow. is from the 13th century. I wonder why they, I wonder what the i wonder what's the, like the backstory of this painting i wonder why they thought that was like like you know horns this... have always been and actually i just posted something on instagram well not just maybe a week ago uh where it's a philippine uh it's a filipino statue of mary and she's standing on something and there's two horns on the bottom and the, the, this my post created a bit of a debate because people are like i think that's the crescent moon yeah and, well, I don't know. Is it the crescent moon or is it two horns? Because it looks, it looks like, like, yeah. Or could it be like a, a pun on both? I have no idea. Like an art, an artistic way of like showing the crescent moon is horns. But this guy here, this guy. You, you know, I don't know why I would say that because yeah. you, the bowl, the, the horns of the bowl is, is the image of the crescent moon in some, in some mythologies. That's right. That's right. That's so right. It, could, it probably is both then. Mm hmm. Yeah, this guy that I'm looking up says that, um, so in this Roman catacomb, Mary is drawn with the infant Jesus. Her hair is styled with the lower ends curling out in the shape of what Jordan, who's a scholar, refers to as the Greek letter Omega. Okay. Wow. So, and that is the horn. So the, the Greek letter Omega or the Omega design is associated with fertility and the uterus, and it's loaded with cryptic meaning. Okay. And the Omega symbol was often used in Egyptian ritual arts to depict a cow's uterus, though in the case of Isis and even Astarte, the Syrian goddess, oh, the Omega wow. symbol is often inverted so that it looks like the goddess is wearing a large pair of horns. Wow. I found this on the web for the Syrian goddess Omega symbol. It is often inverted so that it looks like the god is wearing a large pair of horns. Check it out. Wow. That's amazing. So Astarte is a another version of Venus, um, right? Yes. From yes. from that yes. from that part of the world too. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Makes yeah. you wonder if there's some influence of that going on there too. And so, and you know, often I hear um, this this you know the concept of Alpha and Omega, and the concept of husband and wife, and now I'm thinking Jesus and Mary, like. I hadn't put this thing about the Omega symbol together and the sort of inverted possibility of wearing horns. Like, I was just like, what? I had to read that like twice. Like, what? What? That's amazing. So who knows? Does Artemis ever have horns on or no? You know, Artemis does not have... Well, she when she's Celine, she has the little horn, which is the oh, crescent. Oh, yeah. That's how, that, and there's a moon again. Yes. So it does connect the moon and the horns. That's... That makes you wonder if that's what they were what they were thinking with the Mary thing. Yes, Selena. It could be. It could she, be. It's like so. The, and this is this would be mind blowing if this was the case. If the artist had in mind the fact that Artemis and Selena become synced in some ways, what if also Mary and Selena are being synced in that painting? Okay, but Neil, we have no doubt that Artemis and Selene become synced. Right. That's what I'm saying. So, so you're absolutely on that track. And there's, I mean, I'm sure there are scholars that will argue that Celine and Mary have very many commonalities as well. So right. I think you can make that argument that you were just talking. I think you can make that argument because we know that Artemis as Diana 
is becomes associated with Celine. It's very yeah. there's, there's a deep overlap. And yeah, whenever every, all the paintings of Diana always have the moon. That's right. That's you right. Know. You know, because the Romans kind of blend them together. Um, yeah. And that's what the Christians end up doing. They kind of take on that. They kind of take on that role of like synchronization. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is the Roman Empire. I mean, right. So it would have been very, very common for them in their practice to adapt exactly. whatever they liked about their past divine beings to this modern divine being. Um, but there's just there just seems to be so much power in symbolism. Like I'm, I love symbols. I mean, you could get lost down the rabbit holes of symbols, you know, forever because there's just so much meaning, right, you know, in them. Um, but the horns have become my. And in this case, you know, her hair is made into it looks like horns, which then reminds me of the modern piece of art. Uh, that was in New York City, where her hair was also made into art. Uh, Shahiza's uh, art in New York City, uh, with that gold, you know, that gold woman statue with the with the hair. So, like, there's just so much. Yeah. It, you know, it sometimes takes a little while to really digest it all. Um, I hear you. Yeah. Now, what is there any anything else that you would? Um. Obviously, there's a lot we can talk for hours on this, but and I recommend your channel for anyone who wants to go deeper. But is there anything else that you think is uh, that you th that comp that connects Mary to Artemis that you have you've seen? Well, we've talked about okay, so we've talked about the Black Madonnas. We've talked about the names. We've talked about the physical location. Mm, yeah, we've talked about bees a little bit. And this concept of milk and honey. So this concept of like breastfeeding or feeding the world. Oh, yeah. um, and the virginal bees and this idea of prophecy and bees and all that kind of stuff. I think those are probably the main. Um, yeah, I would. I don't know that there is anything else. Oh, and we talked about the, the consort relationship the uh, Artemis and Apollo and uh, Mary and Jesus. So that sort of duality, the feminine and masculine together. Um, yeah. And in Revelation, Jesus is called the morning star. Right. So right. there's that title, you know. Yeah, there is. I don't know. I don't know. Um like, I don't know why we people don't think that these Mary and Jesus, let's say, if we take them to, are not sort of the, the sort of last train stop of the, the Romans as far as divine depiction. Like, it seems to me that they are the latest gods in a very long line of gods that have ever existed, but it seems like they are the same gods. You know what right. I mean? But I don't know why people find that, uh, why people are, are sometimes uncomfortable with that knowledge. I think it's- I don't know why clear. either. I think it's just, yeah. no, I think it just makes sense. I don't know. I, I guess they want the uniqueness of saying like, oh, there's this one person that came one time in all of history and has this one experience and looks like, you know, maybe perhaps it takes away their, you, the uniqueness of you know yeah but but i think uh i think the things you're saying and you know what other people are saying about these parallels are just completely clear and just make sense oh the one thing we didn't talk about is virginity right so That's and chastity and the concept of chastity so we know that they're both virgins okay supposedly uh this, this concept of Parthenos, but then chastity as well, because then Mary is supposed to be chased afterwards and becomes this kind of chaste being. And remember in the infancy gospel of James, when I can't remember, Salome doesn't believe that Mary is still a virgin, even after she gives birth to Jesus. So she doubts her. And then she sticks her hand in Mary's crotch. 
and her heart hand begins to melt on fire, like in the Indiana Jones movies. Yeah, yeah, that's She's like screaming, scene. and then yeah. I can't remember who says to her, "Oh, let Jesus, let the baby touch you, and you will be healed." And then she's like, "Oh, now I believe." So this idea that Mary is forever virgin and forever chaste is very much in connection to the concept of Artemis being forever virgin, forever virgin, yeah, forever chaste. That's what Cal Calamachus Calamachus has in his hymn to Artemis, right? Forever virgin. That's what he says. He specifically says it just like that. Yes. Although, again, the biggest debate here is that it's unclear what the Greeks meant by Parthenos, forever virgin. Uh, because there's so many interpretations. Because they could have meant pious, of course. That's what I mean. Like It didn't ha necessarily have to do with, like, physically. It meant, like, I am that. Like, like I am. Like, that's what I am. Yes. Like, I, I need to be treated that way. Like, Yes. It's hard to explain it, but like I know, right? It's, I know it. Like it's it's not just it just doesn't mean literally what it says. It means something different. Yeah, it's not a biological hymen issue, right? Right. It's more like a more title. That's right, and and like um, like I'm unmarried in a sense too. That always fits too. A woman that was unmarried would have been Parthenos. Um, so it's like you see it you with know, Athena too, Athena, right? Right. Um, it doesn't imply that they never had intimate relationships, but they were not with a man and they were not mothers and they were not whatever. But uh, and but I mean, Mary completes both in a sense, because Mary is both unmarried and retains her hymen even after giving birth to a baby uh, and is proven so by Salome and then con supposedly continues to be chased after her. I mean, this is what the assumption story is, right? Like her her body is so sacred that when she dies, the angels come down and take her body up to the heavens. That's what the wow. assumption celebration is, right? So there's no gravesite for Mary because she wouldn't have been buried in the earth because her body was so sacred that it carried a god. Wow. Right. So and and back to what I was saying before about the Tony Professor Tony Burke was saying that this text was like central to Christians. It wasn't like we look at it now and we say, eh, it's just an apocryphal text. That's not how they saw this text in its time. Yeah. They saw this text as like, this is the, these are the legends. This is what everybody believes. Yeah. And it just went, it just went, it went great with the, with the Bible, with the other, with the other gospels. It, went, it was a great add on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that people now, when they read it, have a hard time. I mean, for me, I kind of have a hard time of it because especially when the priests freak out about Mary's menstruation and, and especially when Mary gets pregnant and then, you know, Joseph doesn't believe it and he's all pissed off, even though they had all been prophesied for like, I don't know, 10, 12 years that she's going to be the mother of God. And then they go back to the synagogue and the priests are like, they send them out into the desert and then they try to poison them. And then they try to do all these things to test them to see if they're really telling the truth and they didn't have sex. And the whole time I'm like, but you've been raising this kid with angels for like 10 years. Like what? Yeah, so, it's very, very strange. Right? So there's this kind of like, I don't know what, what you call it, but it kind of makes you chuckle a little bit. Like, it's like really? not logical. It doesn't make logical sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But. But I think it's the the story. The story is magical, right? It's mythological, and I think people would have loved that at the time. They would have really. And plus, I think a lot of people ask this question: like, okay, Jesus is God, but why Mary? It's always a question: why her? Why not, you know, some other girl? Why not any girl? So they had to create the story that that really made her special, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I forgot the name of the Christian. It was there was a early. He was one of the bishops of Smyrna, but not um, not Polycarp. It was a different one. Mm. And on his tombstone, there's no mention of Jesus. It's only, it only mentions Mary. So, like, he, for for his tombstone to, like, yeah, he was a Christian. Okay, no doubt about that. But it's like, oh, the, you know, the, I think it says something like the great virgin gave me a good life or whatever, something like that. Something something along those lines. It was like, yeah. I'm like, it's all. That's it. That's all it mentions. Like. And that's what I want to, and we were mentioning, we were talking about this earlier. It's like, that's what I'm trying to exp explain to people. It's like, Mary is like sin. It's just, she's the, she is God. Like yeah. it's, just, it's another synonym or like title of the Godhead, especially early on in the second century. 
and you know, while you're saying that, I'm I'm thinking that you're absolutely there's a lot of men that are fascinated with virginal goddesses. And I don't know what the psychology, if there's the unattainability mixed with perhaps some kind of, you know, thinking of like, this is this, this woman is so like perfect. And because for women, Mary, it's something about that image. There's that. something there. It's like, it's like a combination of like a maternal, a maternal being, but a virginal pure being, but a being that doesn't challenge you. It's really interesting because for women, I think that Mary poses some problems because she, it's also unattainable. You cannot be a virginal mother. It's just not possible. So she becomes this figure of, un, you just can't be, you can never be this perfect woman as Mary. And so you're always in the, you know, and then you have that sort of virgin and whore kind of situation of like, um, which where you know which is the woman that you take home to your mother and which is the woman that you you know you enjoy being with kind of thing. So Mary, like that depict that part of the Mar of Mary's depiction has really caused some tension um, and some expectations for women um, that I don't know. I don't know that they were always good. Uh, and then that that second coming of Eve, you know, erasing Eve's sin. You know, like the good girl came and erased the bad girls, you know. So it caused, you know, there's a lot of feminist scholars that are, have this weird, weird relationship with Mary because you kind of love her, but it also puts you in this weird position where you're constantly being compared to something that's unattainable and, and, and un, like it's unreal, it's unscientific. You can't have kids, yeah. be a virgin. Um, and then, yeah, I agree. Like there was a Pope, I can't remember which one it was, uh, not that long ago, like in the 90s. Maybe, maybe it was Pope John Paul II who wanted to make the Virgin Mary co-redemptrix with Jesus. He wanted to pass this bill or this legislation or whatever to say that the Virgin, he was, he loved the Virgin Mary arguably more than Jesus. And he tried to put this through. And the argument again was, well, then you're elevating her to the equal of Jesus. And he was trying to say, yes, she's a co-redemptrix, Right. Uh, but it never made it through because they were too worried that people would totally gravitate to Mary. And what would Jesus do, you know? Right. But I mean, he's a Pope. Like, yeah. but he was so in, like, he was so in love and in worship with Mary that he wanted to push this through. Yeah. Oh, I found the gravestone. It's Eber okay. Eberkios. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can get a, this will be interesting for people who are wondering. Abergius of Hierapolis. Uh, let, me see if I can, let me see if I can pull up the text. Hold on a second. Inscription of Abergius. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. I found it. So this is, you know, sort of the same region of the world, you know. Yeah. Minor. Make it bigger. Uh, you know, Hierapolis is it's in Turkey. Phrygia. Yeah. Uh, here's what it says. You know, the citizen of a chosen city I made while I was here, blah, 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 blah. And then you'll see, um, where is it? Contemporary gold robes. Um, everywhere. I had Paul. I had faith everywhere. Let me, as if my food of fish exceeding great size. Which the Holy Virgin drew with her hands from a fountain, and this faith her ever gives to its friends. Now, you know he's talking about how you know the the Holy Virgin, you know, provided for him in his life and blah blah. But like that's that like th th what does that tell you about Christians early on? How they saw God as this, you know, th is the title of Holy Virgin was synonymous of just saying, yeah, God help me in my in my when I was in situ certain situations, you know? Well, but it's funny because she does the things that Jesus does. So she gives him fish, wine, and bread. Right. So, like, those are the things that Jesus, you know, did exactly. as his kind of miracles. But he's saying she's doing them. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing. Here's what it looks like for, for people that want to. That's the Greek. But it's there's no, the word Jesus doesn't even appear on here. Amazing, isn't that isn't that something? There's not no mention. It just says Holy Virgin. So, 
and, you know, and that could easily have been like all of there's so many uh, men or his ancient ancient, I don't know, men who write about Artemis in that way. Like right. she saved my life. She healed me from this. She gave me this. But and women too. But but so this could ease like this is very comparable. Yeah. Very, very comparable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's the same Greek world that we're talking about. Yeah. Talking about yeah, the same, you know, like it's century. Yeah. The culture really does uh shift, you know. Yeah, I I find it fascinating. I don't know. I, I don't I don't know if it minimizes sort of the the sacredness of Mary. Like sometimes, you know, as a Catholic, I don't think it does, but I I yeah. do see that Christians try to they think that's what I'm trying to do, and I'm not. Yeah, they think, oh, you're just trying to tear down. No, it's not. I actually think it strengthens that Christianity. Yeah. This is it, the shows, way I, it shows it shows right. how universal Christians can be. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, this is the way I tell it to my students because I usually take them, like especially my religious studies students, in the first week I always kind of go, okay, so before we start, I'm going to tell you my story because your faith, your faith is either going to be more strengthened or you're going to struggle because I struggled a lot. Uh, and so how did I come through these kinds of things and blah, 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 and it helps them. But that, I agree, like at some point I had to turn around to myself and go, even if Mary was not physically a virgin, does that change that you know does that change my faith well now that i'm a goddess worshiping pagan <laughs> perhaps it did although i would argue that mary was the very first goddess i worship you know yeah it's all about perspective really that's right that's right uh so yeah it's it's tough sometimes to go through the history and present it and there's clearly evidence there um but what can we do? This is what we. This this, this is uh, this is what we're called to do. <laughs> exactly, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I definitely, uh, I think in, in Ephesus, I would argue that uh, the Vir Virgin Mary was a perfect fit, a perfect fit for that city, and that place, and the goddess like Artemis. And so my argument though is that Artemis survives in the Virgin Mary. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. And then I guess in that sense, Kybele survives through that thing too. And so Which would make sense for down in Egypt for Isis to survive through marriage. That's right. That's right. She so sort of takes on this this universal role of the yes. mother virgin figure. Yes. In a way it's almost like the goddess or the goddesses had to figure out a way to survive this new age or whatever it was happening. And they kind of fit into Mary the best way that they could. And now we're at a time where we can unpack it again and look around and be like, oh, okay, let's let's see how the ancients lived, right? And just rediscover them because I guess Mary had carried them around for the last 2,000 years, you know? Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Wow, I'm fascinated by all this stuff. Um, I definitely want to once again remind anyone that's still watching check out the link down below and subscribe to the Goddess Project I highly recommend it and uh, we're going to do more of these in the future yeah. so stay tuned for that uh, anything else you want to talk promote or anything that's coming out any videos coming up I'm working on this book on Artemis of Ephesus which is kind of taking a while my next video, I don't know what I'm going to title it, but it's going to be Apollo about Apollo. And I think I'm going to call it Why Apollo Sucks So Much. No way. I can't wait to watch that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> he drives me nuts. He drives Does he really? Nuts. I am not a fan of Apollo at all. And I know a lot of people that are. And I'm always. So I think I'm going to put together like. A I little... always like Dionysus more than Apollo. Of course. Dionysus is boo. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to make a list of like all the ways Apollo sucks. And I think that's going to be my my next episode i can't wait to watch that i'll check it out <laughs> anyways thank you for everything and you have just attained true gnosis